a massive battering ram relentlessly pounded against Kanesh's fortified gate. Weary defenders atop the walls were shooting arrows, but deep down they knew the battle was lost. King Uno Zalpa and his mighty army had descended from their coastal kingdom to the heart of the region. After months of siege, they emerged victorious. Kanesh, the city that served as the hub of the regional trading network, was about to fall into King Una's hands. When the main gate finally yielded to the battering ram, triumphant cheers erupted from the siege camp. The foreign merchants that had established their headquarters in Kanesh may have hoped that this was just another crisis. Kings and their wars come and go, and everything will return to normal. But this time, everything was different. My name is Sarah, and today we will explore how imperial ambitions destroyed the early Bronze Age trading system. Welcome to the mists of time. The Kingdom of Kanesh was located in the Anatolia region, modern-day Turkey. During the Bronze Age, the region was divided into numerous kingdoms, resulting in a complex political landscape. Despite occasional warfare, the kingdoms shared a common interest. In fact, a network of trade routes spanned the entire region. Traders from the Mesopotamian city of Ashur regularly made trips to Anatolia to sell their goods. These Assyrian merchants transported strategic resources that were crucial for bronze production. The creation of this metal alloy requires copper and tin, two metals that are rarely found in close proximity. Hence, long-range trading became a necessity. The trade network was highly advanced, leading the Assyrian traders to establish trading posts known as karums near all the major Anatolian cities. These karums served as trading hubs where traders resided with their families and managed local businesses. Among the many karums, Kanesh's one was the primary headquarters of this extensive web of trade routes. The trading network essentially established one of the earliest global markets, benefiting all parties involved. It was crucial for bronze production as, without it, no bronze could be manufactured. However, the merchants were a prime target for bandits. Safe roads were required and various regional kings were more than ready to provide much-needed protection. In exchange for toll payments and import taxation, of course. The trading system forced the warring kingdoms to cooperate for mutual benefit, reducing the revenues of any king who caused trouble. This sounds like a dream, right? Trade was flowing, people were getting rich, and opportunities were arising for those who dared to embark on this journey. But you know, there was simply too much wealth involved to not create an incentive for conflicts. The tolls imposed on the merchants brought great wealth to the kings. This incentivized the redrawing of borders and the control of roads and strategic locations. Furthermore, vassals aspire to gain independence from their overlords, to maximize their own wealth. The trading system depended on peace and stability, but ironically, it also sowed the seeds of its own downfall. The Anatolian kings, who hosted an Assyrian Karum, held a distinct advantage over their rivals. However, two major kingdoms existed on the periphery of this trading system and it is quite likely that their rulers resented this situation. One of these kingdoms was ruled by King Una of Zalpa, a city situated along the Black Sea coast. Una forged an alliance with the King of Hattusha. They assembled their warriors to march towards Kanesh, the very heart of the Assyrian trading network. Upon breaching the gates of Kanesh, Una ordered the seizure of a statue representing a local deity. This act, known as godnapping, stood as one of the gravest insults a king could inflict upon an enemy. 
It symbolized the complete subjugation of Kanesh to the Northern Kings. When the dust of the battle settled, Kanesh lay in ruins. It took several years, but eventually the city was resettled and rebuilt. Many believed that Una's attack was merely a brief interruption in history, but the Pandora's box had just been opened. A prolonged period of political instability had just begun. Kanesh had been rebuilt, but peace and stability remained elusive as a new challenge emerged. The King of Mama held control over a crucial route connecting Kanesh to Ashur, and he started imposing exorbitant tolls on the traders. Kanesh couldn't afford the risk of being isolated and destroyed once again. This led to a fierce and relentless response. The war between the two kingdoms was brief, but its consequences were far-reaching. Anatolia descended into chaos as a result. Despite the two kings' control over powerful states, it appeared that they were unable to maintain control over their vassals. Archaeologists have discovered an intriguing letter of complaint, in which both kings accused the vassals of the other of plundering and launching attacks on their territories. The situation was so dire that the kings feared a minor nobility might rise to the level of power and influence. The allure of controlling the trade routes and amassing wealth proved too enticing for the local noblemen. This made them willing to disregard the orders of their overlords. The kings of Kanesh and Mama were determined to restore peace and ensure road freedom. However, a lingering question remained. How long would the Assyrian merchants tolerate the risk of losing their investments? Much of the trading system depended on loans with exorbitant interest rates, up to 180%. While potential profits were remarkable, a single failed expedition could lead to financial ruin. And in Bronze Age Mesopotamia, this could result in the dire consequence of selling one's family into servitude. The stakes were immensely high. However, the political situation in Anatolia grew increasingly challenging. King Pithana of Kusara ruled over a neighboring kingdom to Kanesh and Mama. Observing how his political adversaries sought to assert dominance over the trade routes, he likely felt compelled to take action. We have limited knowledge about King Pithana himself but his son has provided us with a description of the events. In his own words, The king of Kusara came down from the town in great force and took Karnesh in the night by storm. He seized the king of Karnesh, but inflicted no harm on the inhabitants of Karnesh. Instead, he made them his mothers and fathers. The notion that warfare could be employed to secure control over the trading system had firmly taken hold. If Kanesh could be conquered, why not aim to subdue the entire region? A single great king could establish much needed order and stability. The king of Kusara relocated his royal seat to the recently conquered Kanesh. The economic center of Anatolia was under his rule. He recognized that the era of cooperation had reached its end. The expectation of multiple kings maintaining open the trade routes was no longer viable. When King Anitta, the son of Pithana, ascended to the throne, he initiated a campaign to unify the region. He adopted the title of Great King and firmly believed that the Anatolian people should be governed by a single ruler. All the kingdoms along the Halis River were forced to recognize King Anitta as their overlord. But Anitta's imperial agenda could not go unchallenged. Husiya, king of Zalpa, and Piusti, king of Hattusha, once again united their kingdoms in an alliance. But the great king quickly attacked them before they could unite their armies. 
Anita and his warriors follow the river and attack the city of Zappa, taking King Husiya captive. With the city of Zappa under his control, King Anita turned his attention towards Hattusha. The city was besieged, leading to a desperate shortage of food among the population. Once the defenders had been sufficiently weakened, the king of Kusra and Kanesh commanded a ruthless nighttime assault. The city of Hattusha was destroyed. In Anita's own words, On its site, I sowed weeds. May the storm god strike down anyone who becomes king after me. And resettles Hatiza. After the defeat of Hattusha and Zalpa, a noteworthy event took place. Do you recall the god napping perpetrated by King Uno of Zalpa in the past? King Anita, having taken the King of Zalpa as his prisoner, forced him to return the stolen statue. This action held great significance from a propaganda standpoint. Despite his previous victories, King Anita faced further challenges to his authority. The kingdom of Salatiwara in the west proved to be a formidable opponent. Two campaigns were needed to bring it under his control. Ultimately, Anita succeeded in plundering the city of its riches and setting it ablaze. Between these two campaigns, King Anita solidified his position as the great king by showcasing his power in a remarkable display. He transported a variety of wild animals to Kanesh, including two lions, 70 wild pigs, leopards, deer and wild goats. The purpose behind Anita's creation of a Bronze Age zoo remains uncertain. One hypothesis suggests that it was a display of dominance over the wilderness, and by extension over the other kings. Alternatively, it could have served as a means of replenishing a hunting reserve, allowing Anita to showcase his military prowess to his newly acquired vassals. Anita, being a skilled propagandist, meticulously curated his image especially since another individual now held the title of Great King. The King of Purushanda was in the process of solidifying his authority over the neighboring smaller kingdoms. As a result, Anatolia was now on the brink of a major war. A clash between the two great kings was inevitable. Armies were mustered, the soldiers were ready for the final showdown, but... The king of Purushanda saw Anita's great army and took a wise decision. He surrendered without a fight. To mark his submission, the great king of the West presented Anita with two significant gifts. An iron scepter and an iron throne. During the Bronze Age, iron was only obtainable from meteorites, making these gifts symbolize Anita's status as a truly remarkable king. With the consolidation of his imperial conquest, Anita became the ruler of Abbas kingdom. However, the subsequent events that unfolded remain largely unknown or undocumented. The very act of imperial conquest, which aimed to control the flow of wealth from Mesopotamia, caused the Assyrian traders to flee. And in the end, the unity achieved by Pithana and Anita in Anatolia proved to be ephemeral. Unfortunately, there are limited written documents available to shed light on what precisely happened. Our main sources of information come from the concerns expressed by merchants regarding their investments in Anatolia. Yet, within a single generation, the trading system in the region came to a permanent end. One thing remains certain. Anita's empire may have crumbled, but the concept of a united Anatolia and a single king had become apparent. The stage was set for the emergence of the fiercest warrior kings of the Bronze Age, the Hittites. I hope you enjoyed this video. Next time, we will explore how King Atushili will transform his small kingdom into a regional power. But if you're interested in learning about how the Assyrian traders in Anatolia operated,
check out this other video.